Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back and we are going to start with the second lecture on international relations. Uh, in the previous lecture, we have looked at uh, what the international constitutes, the long journey IR has made from its inception in 1919 in a small department in Abstisthwith in Wales, uh, the academic journey it has made from Western Europe to possibly every corner of the globe academically. Uh, realistically as well, non-academically as well, uh, IR is a subject which compels people to think about their, their relation to the world. So in many ways, each one of us is imprecated in IR, academically as well as unacademically. Uh, now in today's second lecture, what we're going to do is, uh, we're going to look at the various ways of understanding international relations academically. Uh, we will be looking at each of these theories in further detail in a separate uh, lecture following this. But in today's lecture, what I'm going to do is quite broadly introduce um, academic uh, ways of looking at IR, um, the journey it has made uh, in the last 100 years, uh, the several changes that have come about, and also look at what constitutes theory and uh, the various uh, ways of looking at IR. So we must return where the journey begins and that is 1919, uh, which is when the first department was set up. And again, this is a very, very interesting year because it is the end of the First World War. And as I mentioned before, till the Second World War, the First World War was called the Great War because it really was the greatest and hor most horrific war ever fought. It was the first war uh, where uh, there was um, uh, chemical weapons were used by Germany, again pushing the limits of what constitutes uh, barbarity, uh, the lowest law of humanity. So in many ways, the First World War shaped the thinking, uh, the expectations and the recognition of the violence within. 1919 is also important because this is the year when the Treaty of Versailles is uh, signed um, and in many ways the victor states, that, are, that is the allied states, that is the United States, Britain, France, come together and declare a period of peace. Uh, now the First World War set off two lines of thinking. The first one is called the ideal utopian the vision, the expectation that such a barbaric war must not take place again. Now the utopians as they are called, and of course we know that the word utopia, which was used uh, by Thomas More in his 16th century uh, fantasy uh, book, Utopia, it can be translated as a world which does not exist, there it means no world. But the utopians were called utopians because they had this fervent belief that we can achieve a world where there is no war, no suffering, um, no pain and no uh, killing on the battlefield or beyond that. So the liberal utopian, uh, the ideal utopians were committed to a world uh, marked by peace and of course they were vexed and overcome by this question of what the legacy of the first world war. So the questions that uh, they were, uh, the answers that they were seeking were what is uh, suffering worth? Uh, the millions of people who have died in the First World War, what, was their, what were their lives worth? Uh, how can we prevent such a war from taking place again? And it is this mixture of hope um, and expectation of the future that committed the ideal uh, utopians to a vision of a world with, without war and one with peace. And it is at the same time when academic uh, departments in IR are being set up at the London School of Economics uh, in the UK, uh, that there is also a simmering recognition that hope cannot determine the outcome of IR. And it is also at this time that one sees that 
uh, E. H. Carr, Edward Hallett Carr, uh, who is working as a diplomat in the British government on foreign policy, is also formulating the ideals, his ideas, which would then become the classic text in IR, the 20 year crisis, which was published in 1939, just before the outbreak of the Second World War. So broadly, this period, which one sees between 1919 and 1939, is a rich period, uh, precisely because in the West, uh, American and British scholars are vexed and overcome and filled with an anxiety of preventing another uh, war of the similar nature. We also know that Woodrow Wilson, who is the architect of the League of Nations, arrives with a certain set a set of liberal principles and again uh, liberalism is that theory which limits the absolute power of the state it brings in the citizen as a negotiator with the state it uh, uh, portrays a certain balance between the right and might of the state versus the comparative insignificance the puniness of the individual is overcome by uh, liberal thought. So clearly this period is a period where liberalism is reigning. Uh, it is a period when the League of Nations is set up as this belief that we can prevent a second world war from taking place with this idea that collective security uh, all for one and if any one of us uh, turns uh, aggressive and is a revisionist state, the rest of us can come together and prevent the, uh, the coming of, this, of another war. In short, uh, making sure that those circumstances which allowed the First World War to take place will not take place again. And those, of course, were secret diplomacy whereby alliances were made. Uh, and we know that the First World War uh, divided Europe into two uh, groups of uh, states and which is why the scale of the war was uh, truly horrific. So the end of the war, has a discernible impact on statesmen, that is people who are shaping policy, as much as academics, people who are sitting uh, at their desks and mulling over the true nature of the state, the true nature of violence, the possibility and prospects of war. And this leads to two strands of thinking, which is what we call liberal utop utopianism, the first being the idea that uh, war can be eradicated just like a disease. It can be eradicated and removed if one has the right intensity, rigor and determination. And then you also have uh, the simmering of what we would then call the realists. And the realists are those who believe that violence is an intrinsic part of international relations and um, it is uh, regrettable but endemic to the structure and therefore the word endemic just to introduce another level of looking at IR, uh, two words, uh, endogamous and exogenous. So the word endemic and exogenous means something which is inherent to the structure, inherent uh, and part of the inside. And by the inside is what we mean the state. So IR, if one imagines it to be a, a academic discipline to do with the relations between states, uh, there are two ways of looking at it. The first is that the inside, that is the state, determines the outside and therefore that's the endogamous way of looking at IR. And quite a few theories are classified as endogamous, those would be liberalism and neoliberalism, that the nature of a state determines the nature of the world outside it. So that's endogamous and at the other end we have exogamous which is that the outside determines the inside. So this uh, is often framed as the inside-outside debate where the inside and outside is demarcated by the national boundaries. So then whatever takes place within the nation, the intrinsic nature of the government where, and over here we are referring to whether the state is democratic, whether the state is autocratic. Uh, whether the state is a dictatorship would determine its foreign policy and there is a continuum here because the historical experience of the first world war as well as the second world war demonstrated that 
aggressive states uh, cause war is that was that the, that was the idea that uh, conceptualized that led to this conceptualization of inside and outside and uh, the opposite view would be that irrespective of the inside war would take place because of the structure itself so these are two uh, key ideas which we will be looking at when we look at the subsequent theories and just to simplify this again because it's a core idea within international relations the inside and the outside what it fundamentally means is what is the source of violence and war the endogamous theory or perspective would say that it starts from within the state uh, the individual nature of the state be it a dictatorship or a democracy determines foreign policy the opposite would be that the outside determines the inside and that's the exogamous perspective which we will be looking at when we look at the neo-neo debate the neo-realists and the neo-liberals uh, so the core idea to hold on to at this moment is that IR is a discipline it's an academic discipline which conceptualizes the world along artificial boundaries and those boundaries one, one way of looking at it is by inside or outside another way of looking at it is, is by looking at the state uh, the system and the structure which is that there are boundaries between the state the national boundaries and uh, beyond that is the system or the structure and again one can categorize this in various ways but the idea over here is that there are artificial boundaries which of course are being questioned in multiple ways when we look at issues of uh, climate change and trade and uh, migration so again the point to hold on to here is that IR is determined by artificial boundaries and each uh, perspective assumes a certain way in looking at IR so uh, where, where have we gotten so far is one that we've looked at as to how the first world war shaped hopes and expectations within IR and secondly as to how IR as an academic discipline was also divorced from reality uh, so when we talk about the state system uh, these are abstractions and what one means by abstraction is that something which is uh, not real so the real is often contrasted uh, decoupled from uh, uh, abstraction so the abstraction and real are often separated and IR started off by abstracting and come and looking at IR through a very academic lens so we're looking at two different uh, realms of reality scholarly abstraction which are which are conceptual and the second is the ground reality and the sharpest example which highlights this is of course the process of decolonization which started at this time and yet took a long time to register in international relations vocabulary uh, till about uh, 20 30 years after the event so the process that we're looking at here is that IR begins as a a uh, very uh, ivory tower structure where scholars from the west are theorizing about European civilization the future of uh, Europe the future of the uh, American uh, UK alliance um, the Atlantic Alliance and not very ethically concerned with what is taking place beyond their boundaries and this huge process of decolonization whereby the empires of the European empires were unraveled and the unraveling begins around the second after the end of the second world war whether it is the French empire the Italian empire the um, British empire the French empire and the, when these when the unraveling of this began it was somehow divorced from the practice of IR so fundamentally IR has been a western uh, west preoccupation and the horrible barbarities which took place in the Franco-Algerian war or the decolonization of uh, South Asia the partition of India and Pakistan the emergence of post-colonial states uh, was oddly absent in the thinking aloud of the theorists that we will be looking at and as a social registered colonization 
and post-colonial theory made a mark much later, pointing to the inner hierarchies within uh, Western academia. Right, so 1945, uh, the Second World War takes place from 1939 to 1945. 1939 is the year when E. H. Carr publishes his book, uh, The Twenty Year Crisis, a hugely uh, influential uh, book which critiqued the utopian ideals after the First World War. And by the, second, by the end of the Second World War, one has the emergence of uh, the resurgence of uh, both realist theory as well as liberal theory. We have seen that in multiple ways. Uh, and moving on from there, one sees that in the next decade, that is by 1966, Martin White, who is an English IR scholar, poses a very famous question as to why there is no IR theory. Now, the year is 1966 and his asking this question uh, pointed to the poverty of IR theory. Now, it's a very interesting question and one must zoom in to see the context in which Martin White was asking that question and what was his reference point. Martin White's reference point was with political theory and political theory has a rich and long uh, narrative starting from Plato, Arist Aristotle in the uh, Greco tradition, uh, moving on to the English philosophers of uh, uh, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant and then you have Locke and uh, Hobbes. So he points out to the rich theorizing of uh, political theory where one is looking at the state and the relationship of the state with its people in multiple ways, in complex ways and his question also pointed as to what we understand by theory at all. So when Martin White asked the question why there is no international theory, a logical way of dealing with that question is to what does one understand by theory at all. So let's just pause there and try and understand uh, why Martin White says that and what do we understand by theory and what is theory because in the subsequent lectures we will be looking at uh, at least five theories which are different perspectives of uh, looking at uh, international relations. So theory, uh, going back again to the Greco tradition, fundamentally means seeing perspective uh, and approach but a dimension of viewing uh, reality uh, is what shapes uh, theory. Now that is a very uh, basic definition of co what constitutes theory but fundamentally when one looks at the word seeing, one is assuming a world out there and the person who is viewing it. So the hidden person when one looks at theory is the theoretician himself. A theoretician views the world in a certain way and using a particular lens proceeds to analyze explain, uh, describe, uh, speculate or even critique that reality would all be perfectly acceptable as a theory. So theory is a way of seeing and it could, it does uh, occupy several ways of examining the outside. So it could function as a way, as merely as a description where one proceeds to describe reality. It could also uh, exist as a form of where you put forward a hypothesis and proceed to test that hypothesis which is what Waltz does in his uh, 1979 book. Alternatively, uh, a theory could simply be a critique by which one means that it questions the way in which the world functions, uh, the object functions and the powers and influences that shape that. So in many ways, a uh, theory as broadly as it can get uh, is legitimately multiple ways of seeing, understanding, describing, speculating um, and uh, critiquing a certain ob uh, object. And over here, of, uh, the object could be international relations, it could be a state, it could be a system, it could be a structure. And of course, the hidden aspect over here is the person who is seeing it himself. So we are not 
uh, objects, we are subjective creatures and in our language, in the, our perspectives, in the way we look at things, uh, it is our lens, it is our perspectives which is guiding that uh, choice that we make. So, uh, just to broadly distinguish between uh, two sets of theories, uh, one would be uh, explanatory theories and the second would be constitutive theories. So, explanatory theories exp accept the world as they are and therefore they are called status quo theories and one would count uh, liberalism and realism and there are many forms of theories within this because essentially they are describing and trying to explain the sources and reasons for violence. Both realism and idealism do not have a solution for violence but they are trying to explain it and come around it. They are trying to contain it and control it and explain it away. And then you have constitutive theories which question and critique it. And these theories are theories which emerged in the 1970s. And these would be the Marxist theory, uh, uh, André Gunder Frank, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein would be two key uh, theorists of this category. Uh, one has critical theory which used uh, uh, Horkheimer's view of looking at the world as an imminent critique of looking at the system from within. So you have the Marxist critique and you also have constructivism, Alexander Wendt's influential text which undid or questioned the many assumptions that realism is based on. So Alexander Wendt and constructivism and uh, one has a whole range of uh, the injection of sociology within IR following Alexander Wendt. And then of course you have postmodern theories which are again questioning the nation state, the state boundaries, um, many assumptions which are made and of course which uh, another theory which we will be doing as well would be feminism. So you have two broad categories of theories, one which accepts the way the world is and the second which critiques and explains it and we will be looking at uh, both of them in uh, greater detail in the coming classes. But just for now, let's just look at theories again and look at this journey of uh, the academic discipline of IR and uh, the many vexing questions that it poses for us. So when we look at international relations and argue that perspective is shaped by the person who is viewing the object, uh, it opens up uh, several questions about uh, the nature of theory itself. Now for a long period uh, in social sciences, social sciences modeled themselves on natural science and strove for objective, uh, value-free observations. So in a classic text uh, on realism written by Hans Morgenthau in 1948, Morgenthau, like several other social scientists, was fairly impressed by the neutrality, the objectivity, uh, objectivity and rationality of, uh, of natural sciences and attempted to achieve the same. The fundamental question here is not of uh, Hans Morgenthau per se, but the whole aspiration for objectivity, whether objectivity is possible when one is looking at a world divided by religion, culture, uh, marked by wars and ethnic conflict. Now the clearest example which one can use to highlight the differences between academic practices and a uh, global reality is the fact that even while theorization of IR uh, was taking place in the UK and the US, uh, it was perfectly ethical for European thinkers and philosophers to question the meaning of suffering in Europe and at the same time be completely indifferent to the fact that these European nations had indeed had a long history of colonization, of violence, of control, of annexation, of domination and political will of uh, suffocating and suppressing another people in the name of development and progress. 
that is the clear history of uh, imperialism and European imperialism. The irony of European imperialism is that while uh, Europe conquered, annexed and controlled uh, colonies in Asia, Africa and South America, it was perfectly palatable for them to ask the question of what is the meaning of war because clearly their perspective did not allow them to see uh, suffering and colonization as an offensive uh, vocabulary uh, within IR. So the point over here is that perspective is shaped by location, uh, where you are, uh, how you see things, uh, your race, your religion, your identity, your descent shapes one's perspective. And therefore, IR for a very long time was fairly homogenous, by which one means that the people having a conversation within the room belonged more or less to similar universities in the same location. And this question arose uh, much later of the question of race, uh, gender and hi other hierarchies which are often hidden, implicit within the assumptions that makes that one makes. Theory therefore is a, a revelatory aspect, what the, the way you theorize says more about the perspective, the theoretician and much less about the world that they have decided to look upon and therefore in the 1970s uh, there is also the question which emerges is that of ontology. So in several texts, uh, especially when one reads Alexander Wendt, uh, this key concept uh, is lies at the heart of constructivism, feminism and other critical theories and it is that of ontology and what is ontology but the uh, political, recognizing the political forces uh, that shape one's perspective, uh, ontology means the, the theory of being, how you are the way you are, to be in a certain way is ontos. So this uh, aspect of theorizing came much later in the 1970s and of course unshackled uh, the ways in which IR has been un being unraveled. So when one looks at the manner in which IR has been progressing, it has progressed from a closed door conference in the West with white men speaking amongst themselves and it has traversed along the way and opened its way to uh, post-colonialism, post-modernism, feminism, uh, constructivism, uh, a critical theory uh, and uh, Marxist theory and the room has certainly broadened and therefore theory in IR is not a question of competing theories, there is no competition between these because very often they, there is an overlap for instance between neorealism neo and neoliberalism. And very often there is a conflict of interest such as between uh, feminism and, uh, liberal, uh, and liberalism and realism. So perspectives, approaches, uh, ways of seeing can all be accumulated collectively when one looks at theories of IR. And uh, as a student of IR, it is uh, most advisable to look at each theory not as the sole contender of explaining the truth, uh, but rather than multiple overlapping coexisting ways of analyzing and viewing the world in a certain way. This could make it extremely confusing and beleaguering to uh, a student as to what a theory ought to have and what are the different ways of looking, of organizing a theory and therefore uh, Andrew Linklater uh, who is a critical theorist has offered four ways of looking at what a theory has to offer. So in an essay where he looks at analyzing theories uh, themselves, he looks at four ways of looking at uh, what a theory does. So as a student, when you read a theory, uh, these four um, indicators are useful to uh, keep in mind uh, when you proceed along a certain route, a certain path which a theory has to offer. 
So the first way of uh, what a theory has to offer is the object of enquiry. What does a theory seek to do? Uh, and what is the field of enquiry? Uh, is the field of enquiry vast? Is it looking at foreign policy? Is it uh, looking at the nature of a state? Uh, is it looking at the system? What is the purpose or the field of enquiry is a useful way of looking at uh, what a theory has to offer. So when one starts out in international relations and one is confronted by a wide range of theories, uh, looking at the starting point of a theory is a useful way of trying to understand both the theoretician and the theory. And therefore, we often look at just the theory, but key to this is the experience of the theoretician himself. Again, to return to E. H. Carr, E. H. Carr was a historian, uh, just like Henry Kissinger uh, and several other theorists of this time who spent uh, long uh, and painstaking amounts of time in looking at the history of Europe in order to analyze the future. And uh, therefore, one can argue that when one looks at a theory, the theory is often divorced from the theoretician and the shape of a book. But it is the experience of the theoretician which is injected in uh, the theory itself. And therefore, the social uh, background, the context in which a theory is generated is a classic way of understanding where and why that theory is headed in a certain way. So just another example, a feminist theory and theorizing injects vast degrees of experiences of the writer into uh, the writings into their theorization because of course the argument is that there is no objectivity or neutrality possible when one is engaging with the world. So IR is a way of engaging with the world and in that engagement it is not just the world but the person who is engaging as well the ontology of that person as well as the reality that they create, the artificial boundaries that they create which allows them to theorize in a certain way. So the first way that Andrew Linklater lists out is to look at the object and the scope of inquiry, what is the theoretician seeking to do uh, and that also reveals the hidden assumptions within a theoretician's perspective which are often revealed through the writing. So just to clarify and to simplify at this point, uh, any theory uh, is, is revelatory of the theoretician and is time and space contextual and each theoretician is setting out on a task on the basis of certain assumptions which are never explicitly clarified within the theory but are implicitly suggestive in the text. As a student and as, uh, as scholars of IR, it is the reader's task to contextualize the text and the writer in order to make sense of what the theoretician has to say. The second way of looking at a theory is to see the purpose of political and social inquiry. The first one looks at the field uh, and scope of inquiry. The second way uh, Linklater suggests is to look at the purpose. Each theoretician is setting out on their journey with a specific task in mind. Uh, and over here again one returns to the fundamental distinction between uh, ethical concerns and realistic concerns. So within IR, uh, Pressing ethical questions are always the order of the day, the state of refugees, the state of the climate, the state of endangered animals, uh, the state of uh, the question of toxic wastes and its impact on uh, humankind. So ethical concerns, the idea that there is a moral underpinning to this inquiry uh, uh, shapes questions. And several texts uh, certainly come within this uh, range where they are pressed by questions of shaping the world to be a better place. For instance, uh, the German philosopher's text, 
uh, jo the German philosopher Immanuel Kant's text Perpetual Peace is often hailed to be a classic uh, text which looks at the possible ways in which the world can be restructured and organized uh, to shape and to prevent uh, wars between uh, civil nations and of course the problematic question emerges of what is a, a civil nation. But again, the question is at the, the purpose of inquiry, what is a theoretician setting out to answer? What are his questions? Often uh, scholars set it out in their preface, but often they don't. So for instance, uh, Waltz's text on uh, 1979 text uh, which theorizes international relations uh, asks the crucial question about the source of war. What is the cause of war? what is the source of violence, uh, but it is not from an ethical point of view. There is no moral underpinning to it and therefore uh, every theoretician is asking a certain question and again it is the questioner's location, uh, assumptions, beliefs uh, uh, which is framing that enquiry. Uh, so, uh, Alexander Wendt's text on constructivism similarly asked the question, are identities static or do, does a national identity change? And every scholar is setting out on his journey with a set of questions in mind and whether those questions are ethical, normative or realistic, whether they are explaining reality or trying to change it, uh, shapes the outcome of the text uh, to a large degree. The third way of looking at what a, st what a theory has to offer is to look at the question of methodology. What are the methods being used by the scholar in order to create that reality? In academics, academics set out on a journey where they construct a certain world, an artificial world and proceed to analyze it. The question then which, com which we are compelled to answer is what is that artificial world built upon? Uh, what are the assumptions which go into the making of that artificial world and is it a credibly artificial world or not? Certain books are hugely persuasive. The strength of Waltz's uh, book is the fact that it is e extremely compelling, it's persuasive, its simplicity is truly uh, striking in its ability to convince the reader. So the methodology being applied could be uh, vast and varied. The text could be a case study whereby they look at a specific uh, state, a specific period in time uh, which could be uh, limited by time and space. Alternatively, uh, one could also use other uh, methodologies such as ethnography which is borrowed from sociology to look and achieve a thick description of a particular event. Uh, one could also use the interviewing method where one speaks to people on the field, uh, st studies on humanitarian law, uh, refugees, uh, uh, migration often use a way of descending into the field which is the space of enquiry. So academic disciplines often make a distinction between the researcher and the research. The researcher is often imagined to be a person uh, detached from the object of research and maintains a cool and detached academic distance from what is being observed and uh, one is often encouraged to uh, keep a distance from the field and from, uh, from when one starts off or when one is conducting a certain research. Uh, that is the fairly orthodox traditional way of looking at uh, field and uh, research. But in uh, the last 40 years, that whole question of objectivity has been shattered considerably and now there is a certain dissolution of the researcher in the research and therefore one has a wide range of methods being employed, whether it is ethnography, whether it is a specific case study, whether it is uh, 
you're interviewing people on in the field, uh, be it the United Nations peacekeepers or people hurt in a conflict, uh, victims of the landmines. Uh, so the space between the observer and the observed has rapidly shrunk. And of course, the question arises as to the authenticity of that text lies upon the experiences that it can bring in uh, to that text. And uh, increasingly, in, uh, IR has become a discipline which has welcomed uh, interventions and uh, has opened its boundaries to other disciplines. And that brings us to the fourth and the last criteria of looking at what a theory has to offer. So the first was the field of inquiry. The second was the purpose of inquiry. The third is the methodology employed, which also means that one interrogates the self before one interrogates the world outside. As Linklater, to quote Linklater, uh, when we reflect upon the world, we are also reflecting upon ourselves. And there are layers of hierarchy that we embody, which must be interrogated uh, ruthlessly when we set upon and undertake an academic task. Now, the fourth uh, and last way of looking at what a theory has to offer is by looking at its relationship with other social science disciplines. And in the previous point, we've already looked at as to how sociology uh, through constructivism has made a way into uh, IR, but sociology is just one of them. Uh, whether it is literature, uh, political theory, uh, feminist theory, uh, psychoanalysis, a wide range of theories have been welcomed into what we understand and are as international relations and has truly opened it up to a degree that one has come to question the academic boundaries of international relations itself. Now, this took place in the early uh, 1990s. Uh, uh, by, at the turn of the century when uh, IR as a discipline found itself falling short of being able to cope with the changing political realities around it. So as when one views IR today, it is perfectly legitimate to find a linguistic theory of analyzing how the language male scientists employ uh, in uh, uh, while constructing uh, nuclear bombs, that is the work that Anne Tickner did. It is also perfectly legitimate to be looking at literary theory, to look at the manner in which narratives are constructed in literature about the other. And one can only think of postmodern thinkers like Spivak and others when one looks at uh, conceptualizing on what the other constitutes within IR. So literature, sociology, and a vast variety of uh, several other disciplines have aligned themselves to IR, compelling us to look at the world differently. And a major reason why this took place was, of course, with the sheer disappointment with IR's theories and its incapacity, inability, and reluctance to engage with the world outside. So academics by nature is a closed world. One admits that, but at the same time, IR has been blind uh, to global ugly realities taking place outside. Colonization and decolonization uh, was is one such example which just did not make it within their theoretical uh, uh, rigors of either realism or liberalism. It had to be taken up by Marxist theoreticians, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein and André Gundur Frank, when they looked at uh, the world not as nation states, but as part of an international political economy which took place in the 1970s. And that was also the time when there was a declaration of the 
a new international economic order by new by newly post colonial states but the fact of the matter is that the rapidly changing world is not something that uh, the theories of ir could were willing to engage with so whether it is colonization or uh, decolonization and the emergence of a third world um and the non alignment movement for instance uh, were not part of these theoretical explorations but perhaps the one thing which truly uh, shattered the belief systems of uh, realists and idealists was the end of the cold war that is something which they just uh, they, they did not anticipate or predict because bipolarity the distribution of power between two superpowers was very much part of their theorizing of uh, waltz and uh, john mersheimer who we will be looking at within realism and the end of the cold war unleashed a uh, a huge uh, set of possibilities uh, occurrences realities such as a uh, civil war such as uh, ethnic cleansing uh, such as secessionism which radically changed the map of europe and africa and neither of these theories were willing or able to cope with these rapidly changing realities now the fact that we mention both a uh, civil war and a uh, ethnic conflict points to the violence not between states but within a state and it reminds us that theories come with limitations realism and liberalism assumed and worked around the nation state with definable boundaries right after the end of the cold war the fact that violence was between groups within the state uh, which were horrific and uh, barbarous in every which way also pointed to the violence within so in many ways the artificial boundaries of the state with the system and the structure collapsed at the end of the cold war and compelled theoreticians to look elsewhere and they did look elsewhere they looked at psychoanalysis they looked at post colonial theory they looked at a uh, literary theory they looked at sociology and uh, ir in the 21st century has changed completely from where it was when it began in 1919 from a closed room it has truly become extremely uh, dynamic and uh, to use the the popular uh, current word interdisciplinary so it is completely legitimate to have feminist constructivist quest, uh, borrowing from sociology psychoanalysis and construct narratives of prisoners in abu garib to questions of uh, poor migrant workers in east europe all of this has broken the shackles between the nation state and therefore the term international itself has come to be questioned uh, as the core nature of uh, ir so international relations the word remains but the discipline has collapsed or one could also argue it has expanded to include a wide variety of objects of enquiry the object of enquiry could now be a surrogate mother in the state the indian state of gujarat who is making money on the basis of the commercial surrogacy in place by the government which of course was changed recently or it could move to the formation of the state of israel a key issue of enquiry in uh, western asia or it could look into the life of the statesman and the foreign policy of margaret thatcher and all of these are perfectly legitimate within ir and therefore 
theories of IR seek to explain the multiple rich or uh, uh, dazzling, confounding, beleaguering world that IR is today in multiple ways and therefore these theories ought not to be seen as conflicting but must be seen as a coexisting, overlapping and often complementing each other in the furtherance of understanding what truly is the international. Uh, but returning to the Cold War, the end of the Cold War again dampened, uh, certainly smashed a blow in the uh, uh, opinion of both realists and uh, liberals who were fairly authoritative. They were pretty much part of the canon uh, and by ca part of the canon one means that they were uh, seen as uh, true authorities of IR a position which has changed only in the last two decades. But uh, today's lecture, I want to end with a little bit of analysis of a key work which came up uh, in 1992 uh, by a scholar, Francis uh, Fukuyama. And uh, Fukuyama's book is uh, uh, interesting uh, observation, intervention around this time because his, ob uh, his uh, observations shaped uh, in many ways uh, the scholarship which emerged after that time. It again demonstrated the limitations and highlighted his assumptions in his observations of that world. So uh, before one moves on to the uh, to looking at realism, I think it is valuable to spend a little time looking at Francis Fukuyama's book because it is uh, considered to be uh, the timing of that book and the, uh, the insights that Fukuyama makes uh, have had a long, have had a long impact on the way in which IR is theorized and it might be valuable to look at this text which is published in 1992. Now the timing uh, is always crucial to any text because it allows us to contextualize the author, contextualize where he or she is coming from and allows us to understand the claim that they are making uh, about the world. Uh, Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History and the Last Man, now the title itself is extremely interesting. The uh, uh, the End of History and the Last Man and it uh, invites us to uh, read the book as to what the theorist and the writer is claiming, how can history end. Now Fukuyama is a liberal which means that he feels that uh, a balance between the individual and the state uh, allows the individual to uh, pursue his uh, trade, his interests, his leisure. So liberalism is positioned upon the individual being set free uh, from the fetters of the state to carry out uh, trade and commerce and uh, a classic example of liberalism um, was the formation of the East India Company in 1600 where the East India Company was granted the right to trade, uh, to make profit and to accumulate that profit and, the, and this idea that the state s sets individuals free is the idea of laissez-faire which we will be doing in when we look at liberalism more closely. But for now Fukuyama argues that the end of the Cold War uh, is also the end of history, an interesting argument by which he means that when the bipolar world uh, ends, that is between the tension and the rivalry between two ideological poles, the USSR, uh, which is uh, in 1917, the, uh, which is where the uh, first communist revolution takes place and a socialist state is set up, we know that history fairly well and its opposition to the capitalist democratic state of America and the end of this ideological opposition to the liberal capitalism of America means that history has ended which means that there is no more, there is the telos of history itself is no longer dialogical, there is no dialogue now because there is only one underlying principle of liberalism. 
Fukuyama's argument is a classic example of the belief that the way the state is structured, whether the state is liberal or whether it is dictatorship, shapes the outcome of war. Uh, just to mention another scholar, Doyle also believes, or several liberal scholars believe, that a democratic state is less likely to go to war compared to a dictatorship. Fukuyama's book highlights again as to how a the role of history in theorizing in IR many most and several IR scholars look into history to look into patterns and uh, patterns and motives and to understand the behavior of states Fukuyama is one of them uh, we also looked at Carr and Kissinger as two other classic examples of historians who are who look at IR from a historical vantage point of view but most importantly with Fukuyama we end the lecture by returning to a core concept crucial to understanding theory and that is that of uh, exogamous and endogamous endogamous is what takes place within the state and determines the outside and exogamous is when the outside compels the inside to behave in a certain way. This concept is more simply called the inside-outside and theories often operate around this, again this artificial construction between the inside and the outside. Uh, several theories accept it, uh, at least one of them doesn't and that is the Marxist theory and we will be looking at them in greater length in the subsequent class. So these concepts of inside and outside are something which we must hold on to when we look at theories. In the next class, I will be looking at realism as one of the oldest traditions which tries to explain, describe the reality of international relations and it hinges on violence and war. Uh, but the true, the few concepts that one must hold on to are the artificial boundaries, the assumptions of the theoretician, the arguments and purpose uh, of his inquiry and the scope of her, his or her inquiry are things that one must look into when one looks at a theory. And in the next class, I am going to look, take you through realism and thank you for now.